All right. All right, everyone, welcome to the uh, Modern Data Enterprise webinar here. We have uh, a distinguished group of panelists here and um, we'll get started right away. Let me first introduce myself. My name is Nathan Hanks. I'm a vice president in our Houston office and I'll be your host today. I have a background in cloud migration, data and software development. I've been a CIO, I've owned my own software company that built algorithmic trading software for uh, equity investing. And I've worked with data throughout my career. And most, most recently, I've been helping clients build out their big data platforms, you know, all with the focus of enabling their ML AI efforts. Um, so with that said, let me also uh, kick it over to James Sarah, who uh, is one of our distinguished panelists. Hey, thanks, Nathan. A quick introduction. I'm a Microsoft data and AI specialist or architect at Microsoft Technology Center in New York City. I've had a long career. I won't go back to my COBOL days, but I was a programmer for many years, a DBA for many years. And I spend most of my time educating customers on the Microsoft data platform, in particular data warehousing and AI. 
Excellent. And Roberto? Yep. Uh, hello, everybody. So I'm uh, Roberto Pasquier. I'm a director at New Brand. Uh, specifically, I'm in the information delivery group, and I lead uh, two uh, pillars. Number one is architecture and engineering. So my team is responsible for standing up and owning the analytic platforms that we use here in the company at Newell, which are um, Azure and SAP BW. And then the other half of my team is building analytic solutions on top of those platforms, depending on the business need. Uh, I've been an IT professional for about 20 years. So constant uh, taking, knowing what the business wants in a CPG company and kind of translating that into business value through uh, using technology. Specifically in the analytics space, I've been all combined about 10 years. So most recently, again, standing up our Azure space, uh, Azure technology here at No Brands. All right. Well, thank you, James and Roberto. We're, we're glad to have you today. Uh, let, let me take a quick couple of minutes here and introduce our uh, Paraveda panelist. First off, we have Ansley Galjour. She's a principal in our New York office and is uh, accountable for client facing delivery in that geo. She also has a background in data platform architecture and strategy and is an expert in realizing business value and driving digital transformation and data driven efforts. Uh, some of her accomplishments include discovery and implementation of AI ML niche solutions, building custom enterprise solutions and business architecture assessments. Next, we have Ryan Gross, who is a vice president in our, on our emerging technology team. Ryan uh, is one of the primary contributors to our MDE framework and the thought leadership around it. And he has executed this strategy across, across multiple clients from the education industry to oil and gas to agricultural uh, companies. He has uh, a strong bent towards continuous experimentation and loves to build cloud native IoT data ingestion and processing platforms. Next, we have Ben Reyes. Ben is a principal in our Dallas office. Ben is also focused in the data and AI space with, with a strong uh, capability and prime and tech architecture planning and delivery on the Microsoft Cloud Platform. Ben's led numerous projects spanning data ingestion, machine learning adoption, and what we call ML ops. He's currently leading the delivery of a, a data machine learning project for a major health insurance and healthcare provider in our, out of our Dallas office. Uh, next, we have Al Vasquez. Al is a principal in our New York office. Al is a champion for aligning technology with strategy to capture value quickly and drive your future growth. Al recently built a petabyte scale serverless data platform for a hedge fund. And I encourage you to a, uh, ask him questions later about this uh, via Slido. He has a lot to say here and uh, it's been compared to being as cool as something that was done for Netflix. Uh, lastly, Al has a wide variety of projects in the education space, including the creation of custom educational experiences for school children, their teachers, and their parents through the automation of complex multimedia publishing workflows and organization-wide process automation and optimization. All right, let's now go to the next slide to introduce our MDE platform. So, you're gonna hear us use the words MDE and that's just uh, an acronym for Modern Data Enterprise. And the Modern Data Enterprise is, is really a data strategy that's built on three core pillars. The, the, the pillars are va value, platform and governance. And we like to say that each of these pillars has to be as strong as the other or else the strategy falls down. And uh, my guess is that each of you probably have experience in some or all of these platforms, but just to introduce them, the value platform is, is your alignment with your business partners in their use cases, right? Getting executive buy-in, proving results, and most importantly, building trust with your business partners. The next platform is governance. And, and we all know that's a big, scary word, um, but we also know that it is as critical as the others. And you know, governance is not just about technology, right? And it's not just about master data management and all of those uh, acronyms, right? But this is more importantly about the people and the process and the technology to make your data an asset. And uh, a little bit later in the conversation, this is where you'll hear us talk about something that you've probably seen in the literature out there today called data ops, right? But this is our perspective on how you operate a, your big data platform so that it's a trusted source 
and doesn't become the proverbial data swamp or where people go dumpster diving for data. Lastly is the part that we probably all have a, a strong bent for, and that is the platform, right? And this is primarily the tech and the processes to drive innovation. So we'll talk about things like pipelines and automation and lake houses, inference layers, visual tools, but that's primarily what the platform is. Uh, if, if you have questions about these three pillars, feel free to pump those into Slido and we will get to those in the QA session a little bit later. Um, all right, with that said, as we move along here, yeah, let's start talking about the modern data enterprise. And to do so, we'll spend a few minutes deep diving into each of these pillars and we'll bring our panelists in to help answer some, some maybe what we anticipate are some of your key questions. But if we don't hit your questions, please feel free to push those into Slido. And, and if you see one that you like and you want us to focus on, please upvote it and we'll make sure we prioritize that. So let me, uh, let me first hand it off to James and Roberto, and maybe you guys can give us an idea. And, and James, you go first, and then Roberto, how about you finish it, bring us home? What are the benefits an organization can realize through investments in a modern data enterprise? Well, in a lot of customers I see, the bottom line is they're trying to make better business decisions, and they can do that by incorporating more data into a solution and then have more insights into the company. And the challenge is always collecting all that data, but once they see the value of what they can get insights to, they, they go crazy because they, they start thinking, well, we have all this data on-prem, we wanna move it to the cloud, we wanna generate these reports, it's operational data, ERP, CRM data, and then they start thinking, well, now we can add in weather data, or IOT data, or social media data on there. And I can not only look at historical trends on there, but I can start doing predictive analytics using AI and machine learning to then predict things such as customer churn or equipment failure and things like that. So that's why we say a lot of times the data is the new gold because it has so much that it could use with that to not only make decision, better business decisions, but now we're also finding a trend towards company doing all its work to collect the data. And then I say, well, we want to sell this data now because it's so valuable in there. So that's where it starts getting into the idea of, of being, of monetizing the data on there. The challenge of course, is building out this enterprise, modern data enterprise system in there. And there's a lot of patch you can go down to building it out. And this is where I talk with a lot of customers on the concepts of things like the data lake and a data warehouse and how to bring it all together. But once they do, and the end users get a little bit of taste of it, they just want more. And so we're seeing this as a strategic move for a custom, for any of our customers to build out this modern data warehouse. Yep. Um, Ansley, maybe uh, in your role doing work with clients, tell us how you uh, found some successful ways to measure and track value. Sure. So. Measuring and tracking value is definitely one of the biggest challenges that organizations face. Um, for anything to be successful or not, you need to be able to capture and compare metrics. So the value that can be derived can be both financial returns and data points that show progress on initiatives um, that are metrics based. So in, the simplest approach is when you are pushing out a new capability or product, creating some type of schedule that you are adhering to to capture and measure what you're expecting as far as return, right? So for example, if you are expecting a 10% yield month over month, you would wanna make sure that your platform is, is enabling capturing of those measurements and being able to track where they come from. That's the only way you're gonna be able to get those feedback loops of what's working and what's not in an experiment-based approach. Excellent, thank and, you. Oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry, you go ahead, finish up. I thought you were finished. Oh, I was gonna say, I think Roberto, do you, is there anything you can share in your experience of the challenges or success that Newell has had uh, in realizing value in data-driven efforts? 
Uh, that's I definitely agree with everything you said. I, need, I think for us at Newell Brands, what we've done is the, the biggest uh, value drivers for us or the way we try to uh, articulate value here at Newell Brands when it comes to our modern data platform is two things. Number one is, like you said, we always try to tie it back to uh, some sort of bigger effort going on in the company. So whether it's a business transformation effort, uh, a new project kicking off or whatever, analytics is always needed in every project. So we look at the, at the return of investment of those efforts and we say we are uh, definitely part of this, of this project and you need us to be successful. So whenever we are rolling out a new solution, a new analytic component of our modern data platform, we definitely uh, keep an eye on whether we deliver that value that the bigger effort is trying to deliver because every effort, every executive would agree that analytics becomes part of mostly most projects that are being deployed, especially in CPG companies. And then the other one that we use a lot is uh, adoption. So, you know, we, you know, our, our end users at a company like No Brands, they have options, right? They can do things on their own. They can continue using their spreadsheets. They can continue maybe even using a different reporting system. So the adoption of the platform, it becomes a key metric for us to really understand are people using the platform more and more different components of the two, not only whether it's the data lake or Tabular models or Power BI, we keep an eye on whether the adoption is increasingly going up. Uh, to make sure that people are finding value in the platform um, because it's, it's a good kind of in-process indicator that people are finding value in the, in the platform and they're using it more and more as time progresses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so for our uh, attendees, if you have questions for some of the panelists, if you'll just pop those into Slido, we'll get to those in the QA session. We already see some of those coming in and we're redirecting those towards the, the Slido. And if you just use hashtag ms hyphen mde that'll make sure that we see those and and we'll get we'll get to those all right um al i want to bring you into the conversation here and i'd like for you to answer the question of how do we balance experimentation with governance and platform to drive value so um balancing experimentation with governance is really about aligning governance with your business goals. Um, driving uh, business value has to be both timely and controllable. And if you find that your governance is getting in the way, you haven't really gotten to governance yet. Um, you're, there's, a, there's a new movement um, on the back of DevOps called Data Ops. And if you haven't researched Data Ops yet, you really should. Uh, but Data Ops is, is really taking a lot of the aspirational lessons from the DevOps movement of being able to move incredibly quickly by automating controls and continuously improving those automated controls um, and bringing that into the data world. So if you have a, a governance system that is fully automated, where all your controls are really aligned to your business needs, experimentation and governance are part and parcel of the same process and part of the same capability. So the the need there and, and talking a lot about you know, delivering value allow, relies on aligning with the people who are using that value. The same is true for governance. Um, the rules have to support the experimentation. The rules have to support the need. And by, by getting that alignment right, experimentation and governance are part of the same end-to-end uh, -end stream of value. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Al. Uh, ben, maybe just uh, as you've been doing a lot of work in this space and specifically in healthcare recently, tell us a little bit about some of the use cases you've seen and maybe you can generalize some of those for this audience here that helps drive out some of the best, the most significant value. Yeah, um, I can talk about, um, was, I've got a good example from a, a client that we had that had a, had a pretty novel idea of, of, trying to figure out who their best customers were going to be and who to go after. And, you know, they don't, they didn't have a whole lot of data. And, you know, in the industry that they were in, which is the frozen foods manufacturing industry, um, you know, where the sales, uh, the sales chain is, is highly decentralized. Um, you know, they wanted to, they wanted to discover um, where to, you know, how to get insights. So, you know, what they did was they took restaurant menus 
and they were able to, you know, just by ingesting and doing um, OCR on restaurant menus, they were able to ingest data from there and they were able to, you know, predict what people were buying and, you know, who, who were the best customers they could, they could go after. So, you know, that's a, you know, that's a, a common use case um, as far as like looking for you know, your best leads uh, in the retail world. Text analytics, right? That's right. Yeah. And, and Ryan, while we round out the value pillar here, what are some of the things that uh, we typically bring to the table when we, when we work with our clients to help accelerate value and delivery? So there's a few things that we found that really work in order to focus the efforts around analytics, whether you're looking at your data platform, like um, James alluded to, or the governance like Al alluded to, building those up from a set of value focused statements. So we, we use a tool, very simple tool called a concept card, it really focuses in on defining the value that you're looking to achieve through a particular data analytics use case. So in the, the case of reading menus, you're looking to better understand the product demands of your customers so you can proactively meet them with products that best meet their needs, which is then going to lead to increased sales through better uh, capture of share within your, tar your target market base. That's the value for your organization. Next up there is the value for those stakeholders who are actually going to use this data product to realize that value. So being able to pull the data off of a menu and put it in front of your sales team is good as a first step, but really tying that to their target customer base, making it so that they can find the specific products and learn about those products quickly in order to be able to have the best sales conversations around that is thinking about it from a business process change. How are your teams going to leverage this product differently in order to actually go to market or change an internal process if you're looking to drive efficiencies? Good example there is we worked with a large supplies manufacturer to put together a product ship date predictor that took into account all of their suppliers lead times as well as their warehousing and manufacture, or sorry, warehousing and distribution network lead times at all their different warehouses. And that really was there to replace a uh, process that was involving lots and lots of people getting on the phone and calling each other. But there's some value in the phone conversations as well. So taking into account the stakeholder needs around taking a phone conversation and the context you can gain there and allowing them to include that in addition to their notes on delivery times in order to be able to present a reasonable ship date expectation back to customers directly was a key driver in getting adoption of that type of model. And then from there, you really converge those, those two value statements into the feature list for your data product. And then use that to derive the features that are required of the underlying data pipelines and platform. Yep. Thank you, Ryan, that's that's great. We're seeing a lot of questions on Slido that really revolve around data ops and management. So I wanna, I wanna shift the conversation now to the governance pillar where I believe what we really, we don't wanna use the word governance anymore. I think we really wanna talk about data ops and management. And uh, Roberto, I'd like to bring you into the conversation here and talk to us a little bit about uh, what, what challenges your governance efforts, what traps should we avoid and, and how is governance for a modern data enterprise different than traditional IT governance? We believe you got a really interesting perspective coming from a, uh, a client company and maybe our audience will appreciate your perspective here. That sounds good. Um, so, you know, when I think of data governance, it's obviously it's the management of data uh, to improve uh, the business outcomes. That's always the, and, you know, obviously in field business growth. So to me, that's the most important thing. So here in Newell Brands, one of the, you know, one of the, I guess, one of the pitfalls to watch out for is to, um, you know, that we see is ignoring data and governance in totality, right? Or not even ignoring it, but just not putting enough emphasis on it right from the very beginning. So being very, very proactive about it rather than reactive. So as you think about embarking on your modern data platform, modern data uh, enterprise kind of efforts, 
you have to make sure that you're thinking about it from the very beginning. So how do you make sure that the data that you are bringing in, in and data, data being your most important asset, how do you make sure it's of good quality, uh, of good accuracy, uh, making sure you have the right, um, making sure you have the right processes to validate versus source systems and making sure that you know, people can trust in the data. So always thinking about it from the very beginning as you're building it up, how do we make sure that the data that's passing through everything here is always trustworthy? How do we make sure it's a, a user can have confidence in this data? Um, the other thing is more about, to me, organizationally, you have to be set up uh, to, to have a data governance um, emphasis, right? So to, you know, in, our, in NUR, we have a specific organization in, in our information delivery team that focuses on data governance and making sure that um, uh, from a monitoring uh, perspective of the platform that everything's being followed, everything's running successfully, the data is of good quality and all the proper checks are being managed. So that's a super important to do because um, it, it gives confidence in the data that the platform is, is housing. And then just to kind of round that off, what I would say is in terms of the difference between um, um, mass or data governance and, and a traditional IT governance, um, the biggest thing for me, one thing to keep in track of, as you think of, uh, you know, making sure your investments is your MDE versus traditional IT. Um, in a modern data platform, obviously, if you're in the cloud, you have to make sure that you keep track of your um, of your of the cost component of the equation, because um, you can easily things can come um, can go spiral out of control if you because yeah, you pay for what you use in the cloud. So you got to make sure that you put the right controls and the right governance in place to make sure that the usage that you're getting from the cloud components of your modern data platform, you're tracking that and making sure that all those aspects are delivering the value that you need. You don't necessarily have to worry that, of that much too much in traditional IT governance because you know, you're buying things up front and then you're kind of letting them sit and depreciate in the cloud. You have to make sure that as you use and consume, you have the right um, controls in place to make sure that you're getting the investment that you need from your modern data platform. So I'd say that's the, the, the biggest one for me that we've noticed uh, from a new brand's perspective. Yeah, thank you for that. And James, let me, let me bring you back into the conversation here. Microsoft's made a tremendous amount of investments in this space. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the tools and the uh, capabilities that, that Microsoft brings to help um, manage the demands of MDE governance? Sure, and Roberto hit on the right points and it becomes more of a people process conversation, not so much about the technology. Yeah. So we spend a lot, I spend a lot of time with customers making sure they're spending enough time on the data governance piece. When it comes to the technology, Microsoft has got some strong areas and some areas that are a little weaker than others on there. One, when you get to master data management, we don't have a good answer. So we usually recommend third-party products like a prophecy for mastering the data and then for various tools to clean the data, there's there's plenty that we have. It's sometimes it's become a question of where do I clean that data? Whether you, you do it as it data is moved into the data lake through a Power BI, Power Query, do you clean it after it lands in the data lake with Databricks or Azure Synapse or Azure Data Factory has got mapping data tool, which is extremely powerful to clean the data. And then when it comes to tracking the data that's landed into the data lake and the relational databases and Power BI, and other systems in there. We have a new version of Azure Data Catalog coming out soon, spoiler, that is really good at scanning and, and finding all this information. Now this is a, more of a, a reactive solution to see what's already been landed in there. If there's PI information in there that shouldn't be there or yeah. preventing from reinventing the wheel. If I'm gonna create a new report and need to bring in a new data set, maybe that report or data set already exists and I can find that quite easily. And then there's a lot of security that you put on when you build out a data lake or are using a data warehouse, things like low level security to make sure you're filtering the data for only the appropriate people. It's, it's a lot of upfront work to design all this, to map it out and then pick the right tools that'll get you avoiding people seeing data that they shouldn't. And now in, in the day and age in there where so many of these industries have these very statutes and laws and and preventing big fines by not knowing what's in your data or what data you have of people. It's really important to have these set of technologies to track everything. Yep. But to riff on that a little bit, 
that's why we emphasize that when you're defining your use cases in that first iteration, it's really important that you have the business and IT talking the same language and having representation from someone from the architecture team or someone from the data ops team, because you need to be able to kind of hold each other accountable and honest and to Roberto's like point, like make sure that what's being done is trustworthy enough so that the business uses it and IT is comfortable with what's being done. So for example, if you had a use case that used gender as part of their data, there might be some regulatory or concerns around using gender. So making sure that your team is verifying what conditions and the processes around the data being used for that use case is good to go is going to be really important to drive things forward and actually uh, get to a producible product. Absolutely. Thank you, Ansley. Um, maybe just, you know, Ryan, I know you and I have worked on a project recently where we, where we really got into finding the problem for this client and helping them and what we found out was it was all about people and process and, and the structure that those people are operating in. Maybe, maybe just quickly give us a flyby of how we look at data ops here at Paraveda. Yeah, I think that's a, always a good question to answer because the term has started to get very overloaded by uh, various stakeholders with an economic interest in attacking the keyword searches around it. So in our perspective, data ops is all about the ability to bring together agile software development methodologies, lean thinking mindsets so that you can use some of the testing along the way, both in development and to understand the way that data flows through in production. And a little bit of that continuous delivery DevOps mindset that allows you to encode everything about a particular data pipeline so that you can move it into production over time. Now, when you start thinking about the governance aspects of this, that's where things like encoding the access management. So being able to keep track of what are the key attributes that a user has to have, whether those are roles that they hold or regions that they belong to or any other metadata attribute about them in order to access a particular set of data or potentially having access management only through request and you know where they demonstrate a key business need in order to actually access the data, as well as things like privacy monitoring. So being able to put encoded tests in that, for instance, the gender fields have been obfuscated at a certain point in your data pipeline so that you know that they can't be used downstream from that. And then encoding all of that in a way that you can deploy across different environments so that before your pipelines make it into production, you know that you've got things right from a data governance perspective. And then that turns the data governance councils and meetings that tend to be the what I see as the primary killer of data governance efforts where companies are uncontrolled. So they put together a big governance council, say we have to go document all of our data and everything has to go flow through this and it becomes a massive bottleneck that then slows things down. People lose their motivation for it and then they go back to being uncontrolled. And it's just kind of this endless cycle of trying to get from uncontrolled to reactive governance. Data ops really gives you that capability to move beyond that into a proactive mode of data governance and then expand beyond that as part of your overall value realization process. Like Ansley mentioned, that tying these types of activities in along the way enables you not only to govern effectively down the line, but to make your data more discoverable, easier for people to use, easier for people to understand so that you can actually do more uh, value creation faster as a byproduct of some of these activities that I think were heavy overhead in yeah. other ways of doing doing this. Yeah. Al, I think you had some points here that you wanted to kind of segue us over into the uh, platform pillar. Yeah, so so I'm looking at Slido and looking at some of the top upvoted questions here, and and there's an interesting question about why does why do a lot of data governance efforts fail? Um, and there's also a question right below that, which is you know, what's our recommendation? Should we focus on, on single use cases or individual use cases or build a core platform? And I think they're actually pretty intimately entw entwined here. If, if you build data governance for the purpose of having data governance, um, your data governance pro process is going to fail because data governance can only really exist to serve business value. And if you focus on building a core data platform for the purposes of having a, if we build it, then we can start using it mentality 
your governance process is going to be the same way. And that's what's actually going to cause it to fail is that it's not tied to value. And you're going to find out too late in the game when somebody starts to try to use your core data platform to finally get business value, that your governance rules don't match to their use case and they don't match to the way they want to work. So it's important to really stick to um, mapping your platform to your value and to your governance, automating the things that Ryan was talking about instead of bureaucratizing them, getting them to be part of the feature set and making sure those feature sets can be used by the people who are driving business value. And if you're not focused on business value, things are going to get stuck in, in build. Things are going to get stuck in rollout and adoption. So getting that focus on what are we doing? What is the purpose of using data within the organization? What value are we driving? Allows you to create a governance practice that won't fail because it's not for its own sake. It's for the sake of, of the business's purpose and mission. Um, and building your platform to automate your governance will ensure that you don't build cool whiz bang features and then have to back off and say you can't use those because they violate some of our regulatory requirements or they violate some of our data quality rules or, so, or anything else that happens. So it's really, it's important to make sure that we stick to this idea that all three pillars are required to be equally strong and they support each other in order to build a modern data enterprise. It's not, um, let's build the warehouse, then let's figure out the governance committee and then hopefully someone will get some value out of this. You know, we've said it across, I think, multiple parts here, right? But the, the higher level use case, besides whether it's predictive maintenance or predicting virus outbreaks or any of those kind of things, right, is enabling machine learning, AI, predictive analytics, right? That's, I mean, by and large, that's why we're all really reinvigorated around data again. And so, you know, that rapid experimentation, that value creation that Ryan talked about, Ben, tell us a little bit about, you know, we're hearing a lot also, and we're talking a lot about ML ops, right? So once you build a model, how do you keep this thing relevant in production? Talk to us a little bit about what you've seen there around what we're calling ML ops. Yeah. So, you know, the, I think the, the data ops, uh, you know, term, it, just like Ryan said, is, is pretty overloaded. ML ops is a, is a subset of, uh, of, of ops, you know, in addition to your DevOps, data ops, and there's even uh, security ops, and that's for more advanced people. But, you know, in terms of ML ops, this is about, you know, once I have a model, how do I get it into production? So how do I register the model? How do I containerize it? And how do I monitor it um, so that it continues to provide accuracy um, over time? Um, and you know, your model over time, as you acquire more and more data, uh, potentially on customers or products, um, your models can tend to drift. And, and so what you wanna do is you wanna put in the capability and the hooks to be able to watch that and, and trigger a potential retrain. Um, you know, you wanna get that automated so that, you know, when you're you know, working with thousands and thousands of customers, um, you're able to react quickly and provide, you know, high value um, in a short, short amount of time. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, Roberto, I wanna kick it over to you and tell us a little bit about some of the, the tools and capabilities in the Microsoft stack that y'all are using at Newell. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so we, um, you know, we, we pretty, if you look at some of the recommended uh, reference architectures that we see from Microsoft, we're kind of following very strictly, uh, pretty close to that. What we do normally is we have a, a bunch of data sources, whether it's uh, our enterprise system like SAP or point of sale data coming from our different retailers. And we bring it all first into a data lake. Uh, so we have a, a vast data lake, over hundred terabytes of data. We bring it in using a technology like Data Factory to orchestrate the movement. Uh, we're using a technology like Databricks to transform and, and start getting the data ready to, for an end user consumption. And, we, and the data lake primarily serves for kind of advanced analytics like you, you guys just referenced, um, the, that use case advanced analytics and for data scientists. Um, as we move, the, after the data lake, we move our, uh, into the Azure Data Warehouse. Uh, and in the data warehouse, it's kind of like a staging layer where we get the data ready more for and what we call casual user reporting 
80% of the users we or 80% of users we think are more not doing advanced analysis, more traditional reporting. So we get it in the in the data warehouse, um, and then we feed it into tabular models, so analysis services uh, for fast, uh, commoner based reporting. Um, and then we give them tools like Power BI and Excel to be able to um, hit the tabular models and do some quick reporting. Usually the tabular models are built on functional area like sales or supply chain, um, e-com, those kind of spaces. Uh, so from beginning to end, we give we have the data in different different uh, technologies for different users, um, whether it's a data lake or data warehouse or tabular models, and they can all access it different ways to get the value from that data. Uh, so that's normally what our reference architecture. And it makes it, it, makes it um, really extensible in the sense that that technology, not only does it allow for enterprise patterns where you can um, build consistent um, solutions that uh, benefit the entire enterprise, but you also have the components in there to really allow for um, self-service. So we give tools like Databricks for certain communities to be able to access the data lake and do their own analytics, uh, try out concepts and prototypes that IT doesn't have time to work on, right? So their own analytic communities can focus on that. So it also gives us the ability not only to build enterprise uh, solutions, but also to foster self-service as well. So, so it sounds to me like Newell's focusing on more of a traditional lake house uh, reference architecture, right? Because you have folks that need SQL and folks that want to do some neat new ML analytics type stuff. That's correct. Yep. Yep. That's right. Yep. Awesome. Um, James, I want to kick it over to you. Tell us about some of the, the cool new stuff coming out from Microsoft that maybe we haven't heard about yet or just been recently announced. Ooh, yeah, a lot of good stuff that we have announced and many more in the pipeline. But uh, picking back on, on Roberto when he talked about this modern data warehouse and all these various tools, what Microsoft has come out with that's in public preview right now is Azure Synapse Analytics. I, that's a newer version of what's G8, which was just renamed from SQL Data Warehouse. That product kind of brings it all together under one umbrella, all those various products. So when you look at data factory, relational databases, a data lake, Spark, all under this one roof, including Power BI. And so this is where you're starting to see more of the term that's taking the data lake and the data warehouse and saying the data lake house, because it allows you to use one interface like PSQL or Power BI against data, no matter if it's sitting in the data lake or the relational database. And a big new component of that too is SQL on demand or SQL serverless. So it's a great cost saving model. And it allows you to continue using T-SQL and not have to switch to something else. So we're seeing a huge amount of interest in this. I demo it almost every day. And you're, because of the on-demand features on there, you're, you're seeing a tremendous cost savings from customers as well as amazing scalability that they can get in writing these queries and doing these reports. And then, so you start to get all these new concepts of accessing the data and maybe I don't need to move it to a relational database, which is something I never thought I would say, but now with this new technology, you're seeing that I can get the performance I need and save a lot of costs without having to pre-provision some relational database. And then you're also getting to this federated query approach. And, and just last night I finished this demo where I'm taking data that's sitting in a data lake and I wrote a query on that using regular T-SQL. So I have this view of that data with a view. Then I took a view over data sitting in a Spark table, which Synapse allows you to create a table in Spark, but then use it in this on-demand feature. And that's using regular T-SQL. And then I am also have a, a view on, which is a query on data sitting in Cosmos DB. And I put a view on top of all those, joining all those three tables together. And I went into Power BI and I execute this view. So it's a federated query. I don't have to move the data all into one centralized relational database. And I'm re using regular T-SQL and I'm not pre-provisioning anything. I just paid for query with the serverless on demand feature on there. So it's, it's an amazing technology that really opens up the door to a lot of the possibilities that we've never seen before. So Azure Synapse is really the big technology that's out now that is going to cause a lot of companies to rethink the way they've architecting out their solution when it comes to a modern data enterprise. Yeah. All right. 
uh, it's that point in the session now where we've we've maybe seeded the conversation. We've got quite a few uh, questions. And so I'd like to start to move to the Q and A so we can we can hit that. Um, and it looks like we've got. I'm looking at Slido here. It looks like the majority of the questions are all around data ops and management. Talk a little bit about self service ingestion, um, change management, org adoption, and then experimentation. Yep, and that's. Just to be clear, that's the responses on the poll of what people would like to make sure we focus on. And then there's also a list of questions that are specific questions. Yeah. Well, who wants to take this first one? This is a really good one. Can you do all in a Microsoft ecosystem or do you need outside tooling? Uh, James, I'm sure you have a perspective on that. Ryan, uh, <laughs> I know we also have uh, some thoughts around that where we have a lot of slides that look like NASCAR uh, hoods. So maybe, maybe let's, let's riff off of each other on this one and answer this question. Yeah, I'll jump on first. In theory, every tool in Microsoft works great, but the reality is, and this is where it's good to talk to partners that there are some nuances, some things don't work together very well. Some features are, are could be limited on there. While you could do everything in Microsoft technology, sometimes a partner solution would be better on there. In the case I mentioned prophecy, on there, but then it's important for customers to know what's coming out in Microsoft, what's in public preview, what's in private preview. That's why people in my role exist, is we talk to customers. There's hundreds of tools that we could recommend to them, but I ask them questions, I limit those tools and say, based on use case, use case this is what you wanna look at. Now, a lot of what they choose depends on their skill set. If they are already using Databricks, then okay, you should continue using Databricks. If, if not, then maybe, Synapse Spark or mapping data flows would be best for you. So it, it, there's a lot of, of feedback you have to get from customers on deciding if they should use Microsoft tools or, or third party. And then a lot of times they may come in and say, we're using a third party already. We're using Informatica. So I'm not going to say, go replace it with Azure Data Factory. It could fit in a modern data enterprise in there. Just understanding those spots where you can replace it with something else and, and do what's best for the customer. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to layer in on that, what we end up seeing, uh, you know, a lot there is some tools in the government space, the, the data catalog product. I know there's a new one coming that's been in preview. And so clients debating whether to, to wait for that to go live or to bring in third party tools like Alation or Calibra waterline data that have a lot of that business user focused data catalog. And then you can layer in a lot of your other flows on top of that type of solution. So how do you track data lineage is one of the key things that often gets asked there. As long as you're using a tool like Azure Data Factory or Informatica or other ones to do your ETL pipelines, those stages along the way can provide that. Um, a lot of organizations may use something like Apache Airflow in order to orchestrate across a broader set of potential inputs uh, different stages in their data pipeline. One area where I think, you know, if you're in the Microsoft ecosystem that we really strongly recommend using the Microsoft products is the AI suite, the, the Microsoft machine learning with its ML ops built-in functionality, its tie-ins into Azure Databricks, Azure Data Factory, and the both GUI driven, automated, and notebook-based environments all provided out of the box with some of the best functionality out there. We, we found that that's a really strong case to stay within the Microsoft ecosystem because those levels of integration between all the tools buys you a lot, both in reduced startup time and reduced time down the line in getting things into production state. I think Ryan, the other thing I'd maybe bring in here right around that last question is having a good architectural pattern. We use DataForge, right? Where you break up your pipelines into a discrete set of stages and you have different zones, like, you know, in raw curated production in your, in your data lake or your, in, your da in your lake house, right? That helps you break it up to where you can use some of these best of breed tools uh, and you don't, you don't have this overlap and you don't have this confusion and you don't have this, um, 
you know, you don't introduce more variables due to data translation issues and tool integration issues, but your, your architecture, your data platform supports using a best of breed approach. Yeah, uh, that, that's absolutely true too. Yeah. Let's hit this next question. We seem to be getting a lot of votes on this. What's a good retirement strategy for unused, low used reporting or data sets? We've always heard just turn them off and see who screams, but is there a better approach out there? So I can, yeah, I can start out there uh, as I think if you've been focused on tracking the value as you define and bring use cases onto a platform, you may find that just pure usage isn't actually a really good metric. If you know, for instance, that a particular model may only need to be used by three different people, but the impact that they're having on the business based on changing buying decisions or something like that is driving large scale impact. You don't want to oversimplify something like that, which is why we always try to start with focusing on use cases to start with the value side, stakeholder value side, then to features. And then ingraining that in the process by which our clients develop their own, you know, analytics solutions via self-service, because then you're actually starting to track value from a, a more meaningful perspective. And I know, um, Anza, you might be able to add in a little bit on the, the value tracking side of it. You Maybe covered one. most, yeah, you, you covered most of it, Ryan. Um, I think also, again, capturing what is the return on investment for keeping this particular data set alive versus maybe archiving it and moving to another one is something that is part of your valuation, right? Like what is the cost of maintaining, supporting versus the value that it's getting from an actual productionized use and looking to see if it's worth the investment is going to be uh, probably your best bet. R Roberto, you talked, you touched on this a little bit when you talked about your reference architecture. Uh, and I know, you know, large clients always deal with this. Do you have a perspective here that you'd want to offer? Yeah, for sure. I, I, the, the one thing that's so, I completely agree with everything I just said, obviously there is some, um, it's not the amount of usage per se, it's the value that's bringing back to the organization. So there could be two individuals using it, it's adding value. But let's assume uh, it's been determined that the, the, the item, uh, the data set is not adding value anymore. Uh, the, the one thing I would just recommend here uh, for everybody who's thinking about a modern data enterprise, something to think about for sure, is, is the tracking of the usage of the data set. Uh, Microsoft offers things like log analytics, uh, which allows you to get very granular in terms of the logs that are collected from these data sets and seeing who's using them, what they're using, and what columns they're using, and really getting a good perspective on and, and building your own internal governance tools to be able to see what's being used or not. Because what happens is that you know you you start putting all these things out there, and you don't you lose track of what's being used and what's not being used, um, and to to minimize the noise in the system, you have to keep an eye on on the usage of these things so that you can make a determination at certain points, certain thresholds, to explore whether that thing is really not being used the way it's intended anymore, not adding value, and then uh, making the decision to to eliminate it. And that's the beauty of the cloud that you can quickly eliminate um, or spin down technology because um, you don't longer longer need it. So if I'm in a type of model is not being used, I can just shut down the server without having to worry about the depreciation of that server and things of that nature, so. And I think this really ties in to, to the, the governance conversation that we had. And, and Roberto, you were talking a bit about cost earlier in the, in the talk here. And there's, there's an element of, if you know that you're going to go through a life cycle with your assets here, with whether it's data or whether it's, it's reporting, that life cycle really does need to include decommissioning. And you wanna build that into your governance, into your automated governance. It's an operation that you're going to be taking and you, you need to make it structured enough that it's not, a, you don't need a, a huge operational consideration that to figure out what's being used, how much it's costing and what to do about it. And if you have certain stages of your retirement, like we're gonna move it into cold storage before we finally get rid of it so that we can bring it back if we determine that we made a, a, an incorrect judgment, that, that shouldn't be ad hoc and that shouldn't be um, something that you know, an ops team figures out or, or a data team figures out um, on a per 
use case basis, but is actually part of your governance strategy. So it's, it's really important to really tie all these things together and realize that a good retirement strategy is an aspect of your governance process. And therefore it should be as automated as possible um, to, to make making these types of decisions easy, make them accurate and make them reversible um, to continue to drive value, reduce cost, keep the, keep the business healthy and keep your platform moving forward. Thanks for that, Al. I, I, it appears we've maybe introduced a term that some folks would like a little bit of clarity on. James, I think this one's right up your alley. Tell us what a lake house is. Sure. I probably confuse people. It's the idea of taking a data lake and a data warehouse and making it easily accessible and blurring the lines between those two, those two concepts. The idea being the old way that we used to do things is if I have data in a relational database, I'm using T-SQL and I'm accessing it via certain tools that way. If I have data in a data lake, I now have to go to something like Databricks, create a cluster, use a different version of SQL like Spark SQL and have access to that way. Now within a Synapse environment, I can literally go to a Parquet file sitting in a data lake, right click it and say select top 100 and it's gonna come back with the results using T-SQL and SQL on demand. So I can then just switch that query to work against something in a relational database in there. So you're blurring the lines between the two. I can use all the same technologies on either one in there. And because of a product, the concept of a on-demand or serverless now, I can also save costs because I'm not having to pre-provision anything. So what we're seeing customers do is everybody's using the data lake and they can continue using the easy tools if the data then gets moved to a relational database. Now they're questioning whether everything has to be in a relational database in there because of these fun this new functionality on there. And then having everything under one roof when we call Azure Synapse Studio, that allows you to have one tab where you're going and interfacing with all these products and not have to jump out to all these tabs like you previously had. Yeah. And also finally, it's all integrated with Azure Active Directory. So it makes it a lot easier to jump from one product to, to the next without having to redo your security or, or implement some other, other way of getting to the data. And I know for me, I've done a whole lot of work lately with pandas and, and every time I find myself using the cross tab or the pivot table or the group by capability in pandas, I always wish I had T-SQL right there where I could just whip out a SQL. And I think that's what the lake house architecture allows folks to not have to do this big transition to Spark or R or Python, but if they've got a lot of skills in SQL, it just naturally transfers over. I yeah. hope we've answered yeah. that question for folks here. Well, that's a good point, Nathan. Let me just add that it's a great way to connect your very technical people with your citizen data analysts. Um, I work with uh, a bunch of clients where they have a lot of people that really understand SQL, but they're frustrated and they can't really communicate well with the, you know, the, the, the data engineers and the, and the data scientists. Well, with the lake house, you know, you're putting everyone on the same, you know, playing field and, you know, your data analysts can just write simple SQL against the data lake. And, you know, now they are, you know, they're sharing the same language, which is, which is great. Yeah. 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 We got a this one. Left, and I, I want to try to hit these next two. Roberto, I, I, Paraveda could obviously answer this and say, you should partner with us and Microsoft could say, hey, you should build, you should buy it from us. But I think as a client, I, I think we'd most like to hear what, what's your perspective, Roberto, on how we should, what capabilities should you develop on your own and how should you partner and or buy? And that's a good question. Uh, we, we definitely wrestled with this one here at New Brands for, for a little bit. Uh, I would say that um, my, my thing is, my answer to this was always balance. You need, to, you need to look at the demand that you have coming from the businesses, the, the value, the requirements that are coming from them, and really um, understand how you're going to build your organization around that. Now, we, we assume that analytics is always going to be in demand. So we wanted to build enough expertise in the team where uh, in the technologies that we were going to use that we can build architects and engineers. Um, but we kept that to a minimal because we wanted to keep the core team very technical, very architecture uh, savvy and building the platforms and the way things were going to work. So they're very, but then themselves are not building things. What we do is to scale up because we know our demand would ebb and flow is we definitely want to use partners and third party providers 
to be able to give us that scaling ability that um, you know we wouldn't have never by trying to compete with the Microsoft and the Googles of the world by having these uh, uh, data analytics folks, right? We wanted we wanted to scale that through our partners and keep a core group of people to be our architects. So our model is very simple. It's architects are very technical and obviously they're they're building the platform and making sure that they're defining the boundaries. But we, every most ninety percent of our development we do it through third parties because we want the ability to scale up and down. Yeah, perfect. And in the sake of time, I want to hit this next question as well. Uh, this has been on the board and, and I think we've talked about it a little bit, but there's probably still a little bit more meat on the bone here. Do, do we want to focus on specific use cases or do we want to focus on the platform and the data architecture to enable self-service? And, and Al, I know you've got a real good self-service uh, project that, that, that I think is maybe kick us into this topic here. Sure. So um, it is important to focus on specific use cases and, and get value out the door. Um, the, generally speaking, your stakeholders will become impatient with long running projects to build capabilities that don't drive business value. It's, it's very, very important to target business value. What you'll find as you're doing that, if you have good governance mentality and you, you've focused on enabling people to work within your governance structure as you're developing it is that there will be patterns that emerge. And as those patterns emerge, you can build a core data platform uh, and the data architecture patterns that you need to enable self-service. And you should start thinking about automation right from the beginning and applying it to specific use cases and then adapting it over time. And you can lift a lot of the lessons around how to target your automation um, uh, from from the DevOps experiences that that all the software teams around the world have been experiencing, uh, specifically for the the client that that I've been working on, a lot of that had to do with making sure that we understood data quality was a key component of the business value. That people who were using the data needed to know that the data was um, quality assured before they even started to use it, and and that meant right from the beginning. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I appear to be lagging out. Um, let, let, let me jump over to still hear me. Hey, Al, while you're having some issues there, I want to jump over to Roberto again, because Roberto, you talked about this with your architects. Well, for a large company, you just can't go wild, wild west and just build a bunch of use cases. There is a need for a core data platform and data architecture to exist at the same time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to me, this is an and. Uh, you have to. So, you know, as you as you begin down this journey, you ha as an architect of a company, you do have to hear the perspective of the user because you hear you hear common threads, you hear common patterns of what they need, and you have to extrapolate to see that a modern data platform will meet these general needs that I'm hearing across the board. So, when we first started, we started talking to a lot of different people, and you heard common threads. But um, so with those threads in mind, you start kind of designing what the modern data architecture is, but you have to use a specific use case. Um, so you have a, an architecture that you're building and then you, and you funnel a specific use case through that to make sure that um, you deliver the value that you need to deliver from that specific use case. That way you get the best of both worlds. You deliver a specific use case with value and you're also uh, did a, a good job at the beginning to think about long-term what your data architecture will look like. Um, so I think you have to do both for sure. Um, and you have to anticipate one versus the other. You have to anticipate the long view of it as well. You can't just specific, just think of one use case, build it out really quickly. You have to think of what is the modern thing, what does the entirety look like, and then also fo focus a use case through it. Uh, and that's what we did at Newell and, and, and it proved to be uh, pretty successful. Yeah, that's what we're seeing, especially with large clients, right? You can't frame this as an either or. You, you really have to think about it as an and and figure out a way to manage these two tensions that come that come come about. Um, and if I can, oh, and if I can just real add real quickly on Nathan, one of the things that we emphasize in in MDE is, you know, all the pillars must exist together. And this is where you have to balance your use cases with your architecture, like like Roberto said, because you can experiment all day. I mean, you can create science experiments out the wazoo. But if you're not having the process to actually promote them and be able to create those mechanisms for 
realizing value, then you're going to, like you said, you're, you're going to be DOA as soon as, as soon as it's put out there. So having those, that polarity of how fast do I want to go and then how big do I want to go with both use cases and platforms is going to be a conversation that we have, we have with our clients all the time of, of balancing those two important things of building out your data platform. We're about at time. I, I've got this one last question here that I, I sense is really important to a lot of folks here. Real quickly, Ryan, you and I worked on a client that had this problem. How do you add data governance to a data lake that already exists? Can you bring us home there and then we'll wrap up and close out for the day? You're on mute, Ryan. Yep. If you stand up a data lake that doesn't really have any governance around it, so let's just say you opened up access to blob storage and told people, okay, it's a data lake, you can put data out here. There's really three steps. First, you have to understand what's already there. There are tools within the Azure platform. You can use cognitive search, for instance, to start to crack open an index and understand the contents of what's already in your lake. There's also third-party tools like Waterline that are kind of purpose-built for this use case. Second one is to layer in access management to that because one of the biggest risks with a data lake that that simply is just a bunch of data sitting out there without descriptions is the risk of data leaks by having broad access. And then the third one is to really go through and start to do that usability documentation. So if you know what's there, what do people actually need to use different data sets from? Which ones uh, through lineage track back and are actually just intermediate data uh, data formats that are leading to a final data product. Then once you have that last step, you're really at the point where you're enabled to start building the platform on top of some of your existing data assets that are now cataloged and secured in your data lake. Yeah. And, and Ryan, I think that goes back to that question earlier around, you know, do you build by, like you just named all several third-party products that can help you with this kind of stuff. So appreciate that. Um, we're at time. I want to I want to recognize that there's a lot of great questions on the board here, and we're just not able to get to them all in this one hour. We appreciate every single person joining. It's been it's been great. We'll we'll probably do this again because we didn't get enough covered. Uh, James, Roberto, thank you very much. You've been awesome as usual. Uh, definitely lived up to the billing. And uh, with that said, we will wrap up here, and uh, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.